There we go. There we go. Okay. I think we're ready now. Okay. Well, welcome back, folks. Uh, we are talking about Ozarks history, and we are particularly in the next few weeks talking about the Native Americans in the Ozarks. And uh, last week we talked about what are generally referred to as the bluff dwellers. These were the first inhabitants of the Ozarks. They came into the Ozarks, we think, somewhere um, around 1000 BC, about the time that David would have been occupying Jerusalem and um, stayed around for about a thousand years or so, maybe a little bit more. Um, and they lived what can only be called really a, a prehistoric lifestyle. They were not sophisticated at all. They uh, they, you know, did not have anything that we would refer to as civilization. But the next group of people that affected the Ozarks uh, most certainly were more sophisticated. And those were the people that we generally refer to as the mound builders. Now, if I've got any participants back in Ohio, some of this is going to sound real familiar to you because the mound builders origin started in the Ohio area. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, I always kind of focus on a famous Ozarker. And today I'm gonna put up a picture of a man that probably, again, probably pretty difficult. I imagine only a few people that know a lot about Ozark's history might recognize this man. And yet he had a very large impact upon the history of the Ozarks. Man's name is Ralph. Foster. And Ralph Foster was not only an entrepreneur, but he was also a very important uh, preservationist for the culture of the, uh, the old Ozarks. Uh, he was in the entertainment business. He started uh, the first really large radio station in Springfield, Missouri, that ended up having uh, basically broadcasting throughout most of the Ozarks. Uh, KWTO, as you can see there, there was no neon sign up on the southeast part of Springfield, uh, dial 560. Big country music, keep watching the Ozarks. Uh, he's probably more famous for starting the Ozark Jubilee, which was a country music show that put Springfield on really the country music map. In fact, the case, there was a period of time there in the 50s that Springfield was rivaling Nashville as the center of country music and very easily could have taken over that position. Uh, the, the Ozark Jubilee lasted for several years and it was the only nationally uh, broadcast show outside of Los Angeles and New York in the United States at that time. It was on every Saturday night. Um, I can remember as a small kid actually attending one of the, uh, one of the shows with my parents. Ultimately, um, he ended up uh, being very involved in co collection of Indian artifacts. He was very interested in the history of the Ozarks and ended up giving most of his collection to the Ralph Foster Museum, named after him, at the College of the Ozarks, uh, my old alma mater. And so, um, you know, I'm very familiar with his collection of artifacts. It's very large and very complete. So that's my famous Ozarker for the day. Um, now, let's talk about the mound builders. Uh, Native American tribes settled in the Ohio, the Mississippi, and the Missouri River Valleys and developed a really sophisticated culture, much more so than most of the other cultures uh, found in North America at that time. Um, definitely more sophisticated than the bluff dwellers of the interior of the Ozarks who had led this kind of archaic lifestyle of sedentary farmers and hunters. We generally call these cultures mound builders. That's the popular name because they always left earthen mounds, different types, but, but definitely earthen mounds. Historically, the correct name is the Woodland Mississippian tradition, um, but that's a mouthful and a lot of people don't refer to them that. They, they were clearly a very high civil, uh, culture. In fact, the case, they almost reached the threshold of being a civilization. Uh, 
they didn't quite reach it, but they almost did. Uh, they almost reached the same characteristics as the Egyptian civilization, the Mesopotamian civilization, the Indus River civilization, and the Yellow River civilizations. These civilizations uh, that really dominated ancient history. Uh, the only thing they lacked was a written language. They never were able to develop a written language. They had a pictographic type recording uh, where they left pictographs and all. But as far as developing a written language uh, by use of what we would call an alphabet, they did not. Uh, and that's the one characteristic that they lacked in terms of being classified as a civilization. Um, map kind of showing you these four ancient river valley civilizations. They were all located around large rivers uh, and the same way with the Mississippian uh, because the woodland Mississippians were located around both the Mississippi River and the Ohio River. So in the beginning, this culture originated in Ohio and it's generally referred to as the woodland culture. And it developed about the same time that the bluff dwellers were occupying the Ozarks. Uh, they left some very large mounds. Uh, some of them were large conical mounds. Some of them were effigy mounds, mounds that were in the shapes of figures. Uh, by far and away, the most famous of these is still in existence is the Great Serpent Mound found near Adena, Ohio. I've never been to the Great Serpent Mound, but I understand it's around the, uh, the eastern border with West Virginia around the Steubenville area. That's my understanding in the southwestern part of Ohio. Um, I'll show you a picture of the Great Serpent Mound here in a minute. However, by 100 BC, the early woodland culture had kind of morphed into a more sophisticated culture, which we often refer to as the Hopewell tradition. Uh, these names are really not important because, like I said, they're all kind of clumped together into something we call the mound builders. Uh, but the thing of it is that this Hopewell tradition, which had kind of morphed out of the woodland culture, had begun to spread into Illinois, into Missouri, into Kansas, and Oklahoma, particularly around the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, they did not settle in the Ozarks. The woodland culture, the Hopewell tradition, the Mississippians never had permanent settlements in the Ozarks. They surrounded the Ozarks. And uh, probably the reason they didn't is because frankly, uh, it didn't have a lot of population there. And it probably, you know, it, it was not really what they would classify as good land. Uh, the land they occupied was land that was much more suitable to agriculture which was the key element of their culture, as we'll see. This is a photograph of the Great Serpent Mound in Adena, Ohio. And you can see uh, this is the tail. And it's kind of a, a twisted tail. And then it comes around like this. And you can see it's like a serpent. And then here's its head. And it's swallowing an egg. Um, and this is a walking trail around the Great Serpent Mound. Um, Pretty good sized thing. In fact, the case is my understanding that they really didn't understand exactly what this was until somebody was able to spot it from the air. Uh, I'm assuming by a, a hot air balloon because they wouldn't have had airplanes back in those days and realized that what they saw down there was something that was man made. And so this was the Great Serpent Mound of Medina, Ohio. It's it, by far and away the best example of the effigy mounds and the woodland tradition back in the Ohio area. Uh, so what were some of the characteristics of the Hopewell tradition that morphed out of this woodland thing? Um, first of all, it was kind of like a, it was a widely dispersed group of tribes. It, re it really wasn't one big tribe. There were lots of tribes that kind of like fingers. Uh, dispersing out into the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, they developed the bow and arrow, which was one of the first cultures uh, in North America to develop the bow and arrow, very important, because that gave them a weapon uh, 
uh, for hunting and for war that made them much more superior to the surrounding tribes. Um, they set up trade routes all throughout the Midwest, and they would have traded in the Ozarks. They would have crossed through the Ozarks. They just wouldn't have spent time there. Um, there is one place that, that I know of uh, where there is an old, uh, what we call, what we would call a fort, probably along one of these old trading posts, um, just south of a little town called Mount Vernon, which lies about 20 miles west of Springfield. And uh, it's a little town called Hoburg. There is not hardly anything there. Uh, but I've been there because it's not too far from where my wife was raised up. Uh, and it was kind of a, uh, something called, it's been referred to by archaeologists and all as Fort Ancient. Now, that name may be familiar to you back in Ohio, because there is a really large woodland Hopewell Fort archaeological site called Fort Ancient in the, in the uh, Ohio Valley area. And this is a, a photograph of uh, the Great East Wall of Fort Ancient. And this is kind of a, the Fort Ancient earthworks. And some people think that this old earthen fort that we found remains of in this little town was probably a trading post that was set up to protect the trade routes of the Mississippians as they would have crossed through uh, the Ozarks on the way to Oklahoma and the Arkansas River Valley and, and this area. They wouldn't have stayed here because, it, like I said, it wasn't hospitable for them and it wasn't really their kind of land. But they would have had kind of forts along their trading routes. And this is an old plaque that was set up uh, by what's called the University Club in Springfield. Many of this was established in 1930, this one was. And it basically tells the story of this Fort Ancient in Hoburg, Missouri. So again, there's a real connection between these woodland Hopewell tradition tribes of Ohio with the Ozarks. So that's... So, so what, what was kind of what this Hopewell tradition was like? Well, first of all, unlike the uh, Bluff Willers of the Ozarks, they made pottery. They were very large pottery makers, and uh, they were very good at it. Uh, and they would trade these pottery, this pottery, as well as art objects for salt and furs and minerals. By the way, they got many of these from the Ozarks tribes because these were in abundance in the Ozarks. So they would trade their pottery. Uh, their pottery was much thinner than the previous pottery, particularly that of the Adena area in Ohio. And uh, they, like I said, they also made art objects for decoration out of copper and mica and conch shells. Uh, again, they would have got these from this vast trading network that, that they had established. And some of the areas of trading around the Ozarks, there, we know that there was a kind of a trade center uh, on the Missouri River around the Kansas City area. We know that there was one around Hermitage on the Pomnatera River, which is in the Ozarks. And there was one, a small one, probably around the confluence of the White and the James River, which is now destroyed by uh, Table Rock Lake. It was inundated by Table Rock Lake back in the 50s, but we know it was there, and there are some old pictures of it. I don't happen to have any old pictures of, one of the old mound in Galena, but there are some old ones around. Eventually, the Hopewell tradition again kind of uh, morphed into what we refer to as the Mississippian culture around 1000 A.D., so about 1000 AD, this Hopewell culture tradition, which came out of the woodland tradition of Ohio, morphed into the Mississippian culture. Uh, and these are some examples of the Hopewell art object. This is some of their pottery. And these are some of the art objects that we found. Uh, you can see they're pretty, pretty well done, pretty well made. So let's talk about the Mississippian culture because that's the culture 
that really affected the Ozarks. And again, it's not that they settled in the Ozarks because, but they surrounded the Ozarks and they would have been quite, they would have traded with the tribes in the Ozarks. They would have had a direct influence upon them. It's from this group that we get what we call the mound builders because they built very large earthen mounds. Uh, they built them along the Mississippi River Valley and all throughout the Midwest and the southeastern United States, and they, they linked them all together in this vast trading network. And uh, again, there were several uh, of these large trading networks that kind of surrounded the Ozarks, like, again, Kansas City. Uh, there was a huge one across the river from present-day Memphis in Arkansas. There is a huge one in Spiro, Oklahoma, which was on the Arkansas River. It's kind of right across the uh, border of Arkansas. But by far and away, the biggest one was located across from what we now call St. Louis at a place called Cahokia. And that's what we're going to talk about now for a few minutes is Cahokia, because this place was very important and it's one of the most important uh, Indian sites in North America, actually. This is a, uh, a look at present-day spiral mounds outside of Oklahoma. This is the mound that's, that's left. This would have been how it would have looked at the time along the Arkansas River. <clears throat> Pardon me while I get a drink. Okay. So, uh, this Mississippian tradition really didn't have any lasting impact upon the interior of the Ozarks. In other words, uh, they didn't come into the Ozarks and settle here. They traded with the Ozarks tribes. They passed through the Ozarks, but it was merely just a place to go through. You know, it was a place not to settle in again, because remember the Ozarks is, is a rough, rugged territory. And they just really, uh, didn't see it as a place to live. So, uh, you know, as a result, the Native Americans that had settled permanently in the Ozarks, these bluff dwellers, um, really weren't affected dramatically by them. Uh, in fact, Kate, there's a theory out there that they actually resisted the change that might have been brought about by the Mississippian culture because they, they liked their lifestyle. And the remoteness of the Ozarks allowed them to live kind of protected in a lifestyle that they were used to. And you see that later on in the 19th century when the concept of the hillbilly came around. And you can see that, uh, you know, the Ozarks was kind of a, I don't want to say backwards, but they kind of purposely resisted change. Uh, Ozarkers in the old days, people like my grandpa, my great grandpa, they did not like change. They liked living the way they lived. And uh, they didn't like to see newfangled things, as they would have called it, come into being. Um, this is one of the small mounds that still does exist in the Ozarks. Folks, there were probably hundreds of these things. Uh, and they were probably mostly burial mounds. Uh, but these have all been pretty much destroyed in the Ozarks now. Either uh, they were inundated by some of the lakes because they were almost always around some of the large rivers, or they would have been uh, excavated and torn down. Uh, this is one of the few that does remain that I'm aware of. So let's talk about Cahokia. I, I got a story to tell you about Cahokia. Uh, Cahokia is located directly east of present-day St. Louis, uh, near a little town called Edwardsville. And it is the largest and most influential urban site of Mississippian culture. And it's considered to be the most complex archaeological site north of the great pre-Columbian cities in Mexico, like, you know, Mexico City and the Yucatan Peninsula. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, they don't just give these out. This thing was very important. Uh, I've got to tell you my story about Cahokia. When I was a... Uh, when I decided to retire teaching, um, I read in a magazine somewhere, I don't know if it was AARP or one of those magazines that said something you ought to do when you retire is make a list of things you want to do before you die. Uh, 
give you a purpose in life. And so I thought, well, you know, that sounds like something that'd be interesting for me to do. So I sat down and gave it some thought. And uh, I made up a list of 25 things I want to do before I die. Um, some of them were pretty easy. Some, uh, almost all of them were somehow associated with history. I know that must surprise you totally. Uh, I put a few things in there that I thought would be very difficult to do. And then I put a couple of things in there that I thought, you know, I probably will never get to do this or never see it. But, you know, maybe that way I'll live to be 90 or 100 or something like this. You know, I kind of trying to cheat this a little bit, you know. The first thing on the list was I said I wanted to see a pyramid. Now, I had already given up going to <clears throat> Egypt. I had thought about doing that earlier, and uh, I'd given up on that because of all the turmoil in the Middle East. No, I decided that was my cup of tea anymore. I thought maybe someday I might take a cruise into the Caribbean, stop at the Yucatan, and see some of the uh, great pyramids of the old Mayan uh, culture, which you can do from your cruise. I thought that's a possibility. Uh, one of the other things I put on there, by the way, which I thought would surely keep me alive till I was 100 at least, was that I said I want to see my beloved Kansas City Chiefs win another Super Bowl. Now, if you follow the Kansas City Chiefs in the late uh, 20th, early 21st century, that was about as unlikely to happen as just about anything. How was I to know that there was a six-year-old kid running around in Texas by the name of Patrick Mahomes that was going to be drafted in 2019 and just absolutely blow the Kansas City Chiefs up? And, uh, you know, when they won their Super Bowl, uh, I was so happy. And at the same time, I thought, oh, my gosh, now I've only got one thing left, <laughs> you know. Actually, I didn't have that because I retired in uh, – 2000 and I went to St. Louis to visit my daughter and I told her about my list and she said she looked at it and said well dad said you want to see a, a, a pyramid and I said what are you talking about she said I'll take you to pyramid so she put me in the car we drove across the river to Cahokia now I'd passed Cahokia but I'll be honest I knew nothing about it you know I just I really didn't know that much about it I knew it was an ancient Indian site but I never stopped to visit it because, frankly, uh, I was always on the way to go somewhere else. And she said, let's visit Cahokia. So we went to Cahokia, and I was absolutely shocked. I did not realize that something like this existed in the United States. So let's look at Cahokia. At its peak, this city, and that's what it was, folks, had over 20,000 people. And this was a period of time between about uh, 1000 AD to about 1450 AD, uh, before, you know, Columbus came, uh, 20,000 people, folks, that was as large as London at the same time. I didn't realize this. I, I just had no concept. There was not another city as large as Cahokia in North America until Philadelphia reached that size in 1800, you know, and I was just unaware that there was anything of this magnitude in the United States. It covered six square miles. It contained over 120 earthworks, mounds, and wide ranges of sizes, shapes, and function. And all this was surrounded by a tall wooden stockade fence. Uh, at the center of the city was this huge earthen mound, which could only be called a pyramid. You know, I mean, that you've got to call it that because that's exactly what it was. It wasn't made out of rock, but it was made out of earth. Uh, and it was the ceremonial <clears throat> and the religious center of the city. To the south of Cahokia, right there at the mound, was a grand plaza. And from what we know about archaeology and all, uh, they played games in this area. And uh, they had a game which can only be called kind of a kind of a game like lacrosse. Lacrosse, of course, is an, is an old Indian-based game. And from what we know from, you know, everything historical world tradition about the Cahokians, they called it Chunky. That was the name of it. And they played it to the death. 
when they played this game, they would not stop until somebody died. It was that violent. Uh, so it was kind of like ice hockey on steroids. <laughs> you know, uh, that's the only way I could probably describe it. Uh, ice hockey on the ground. Um, outside of the city walls, lie outlying villages and farmlands. Um, folks, this was a city. It was a gigantic city for that time period. And remember, this is all pre-Columbian. This is before Columbus came. This is a drawing of what somebody thinks Cahokia would have looked like based on our archaeological evidence. You can see this wooden stockade fence surrounding it. This would have been the chunky, uh, the great plaza where they played their game. This would have been what is generally referred to as Monk's Mound. And I'll tell you how that got its name here in a minute. Um, and these are some of the outlying villages that surrounded it. And uh, these are some of the uh, croplands that grew corn, massive amounts of corn. Of course, if you've been across the river from St. Louis and Illinois, you know they grow massive amounts of corn still yet today. So let's look at this big mound called Muck's Mound. Uh, it had a wooden structure atop of it, uh, which served as kind of a residential site for their king. It also had uh, a large, you know, kind of ceremonial function. Uh, archaeologically, we think this was the largest log structure that was ever constructed in North America. It would have been very large. Uh, Monk's Mound's a terrace platform covering over 14 acres at its base. That's larger than the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Uh, it was over 100 feet high, which is not as high as the Great Pyramid, but it contained uh, millions of cubic feet of earth, all constructed by hand. They think it must have taken decades to have built this thing. Um, by the way, they call it Monk's Mound because later on, when the French first came down the Mississippi River and found this, and by that time it was pretty much, uh, you know, gone. Uh, there was nobody living there anymore. It had been, it had been, you know, basically desolated, and. Uh, they built a wooden monastery on top of the mound. Pardon me, not a wooden, a monastery on top of the mound uh, as a kind of, you know, worship like a cathedral uh, for some years. Uh, to the south of Muck's Mound in the Grand Plaza lie some mortuary mounds. Uh, that's called a rattlesnake mound. I can only leave it to your imagination why. Uh, uh, surrounded by a moat. And it was kind of as a ceremonial burial ground for the elite of the Cahokians. Uh, and again, most of the wealthy elite lived within this two mile uh, area that was surrounded by this wooden palisade. The commoners lived outside of the wooden palisade. So this is a picture of Monk's Mound as you see it today from the air. Uh, and you can see it's just a huge structure. I mean, this cut thing covers over 14 miles, 14, pardon me, uh, square miles at the base. Uh, I've been there. I've walked up these ramps all the way to the top. I'm going to show you a little film here in a second about uh, Cahokia, and it'll give you a better idea. Also, next to Cahokia is something that we call Woodhenge. And again, this shows you how sophisticated these Indian tribes were. They were astronomers. And we now know through archaeological excavation that they had an astronomical calendar constructed, someone like Stonehenge over in England, but they used cedar trees and they constructed 48 cedar trees with another one in the center. And these things were set up to determine the signal days for planting and harvesting. Uh, it's also thought that they used it for religious holidays. And uh, you can calculate the vernal and the autumnal equinoxes and the winter and summer solstices. They have actually have uh, people that go there on these key days of the calendar and actually worship at Woodhenge, uh, you know, pagan cult. Uh, the Cahokians apparently left their imprint on the interior of the Ozarks to some degree. Uh, there's a town called Washington, Missouri which lies about probably about 40 miles west of St. Louis. And it's just where the Ozarks really start 
you can start seeing the Ozarks is what we think about the Ozarks. And they, we think the Cahokians use this site as a kind of secret, sacral, sacred religious site where they probably initiated their priest. Uh, and they left petroglyphs. And I'm going to show you these petroglyphs in a few minutes. I mean, if you, here's a, a reconstruction of Woodhenge. If you go to Cahokia, you can actually see this. They've reconstructed uh, Woodhenge. This is kind of a diagram of what it would have looked like. And like I said, they can, they can determine the uh, summer equinox, the equinoxes and the summer and winter solstices uh, by the use of this thing exactly. You know, so it would have, uh, it would have been like a, a, a primitive calendar in a sense. These are some of the petroglyphs. There's a state park at Washington, Missouri, uh, where the Cahokians left petroglyphs. Now, the whole basis of Cahokia was agriculture. They were huge producers of food. This is what allowed them to grow their culture to a point that it almost you know, reached a civilization. They grew the typical things, lots of corn, beans, squash, pumpkins. And because there was so much food, that gave them time to work on their pottery, their ceramics, their art objects. Uh, it allowed them to trade these objects. Uh, we have found uh, copper from the Michigan area. We have found chert from Oklahoma. We found seashells from the Gulf of Mexico. They found mica from the Carolinas areas. They traded throughout the whole Midwest for these things. That, and, and what they would trade would be corn. You know, they grew so much corn, they had such a surplus of it that they would trade foodstuffs for this stuff to uh, make their art objects. These things here, these are some of the art objects that they've uh, dug up at Cahokia and some of the other areas. They were... Uh, very prolific and very, very uh, sophisticated for that time being. Uh, I've got a really short, about five minute little mini documentary on Cahokia Mound. So I hope you've got your sound up so we can uh, kind of listen to this thing. What's up, everybody? This is Brandon with Off the Beaten Path. We're here at a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Cahokia Mounds in Collinsville, Illinois just outside St. Louis, Missouri. What is this place? Why is it important? Well, stay tuned to find out. What fascinates us about Cahokia at its height, it rivaled all major cities of the same time. know very little, even its name, Cahokia, wasn't the original name. It was later named after a tribe that inhabited the area. We have more questions than we have answers, which intrigues us. Now let's move on and explain what we do know. Cahokia was the capital of Mississippian Indian culture from around 900 to 1200 AD. It was the largest urban center north of Mexico and Central America during that time. It is here you'll find the largest mound in North America, Monk's Mound. It was also strategically placed near the confluence of the Mississippi, Missouri, and Illinois rivers. These waterways were important for them to spread their culture and their influence and to gain the necessary resources to build their tools, their buildings, and to sustain their lives. The Mississippi and culture were predominant farmers and their main crop was maize. Deer was another staple of their diet. You can see them preparing it now for a meal. They're starting the fire, getting ready to cook it. 
as you can see here, bird symbolism was important to the Cahokians. This was the only complete sandstone tablet ever found, and it was excavated at this site. Are you ready? It's finally time. Let's go exploring. As we make our way outside, make sure you check out the mounds in the plaza. Their cities were centers for culture, religion, art, trade, sports, and much more. This picture depicts the Indians playing their favorite game, Chunky. There are three types of mounds you'll find at Cahokia, but we're gonna focus on two. The first one was a pyramid platform with a flat top, usually used to put monuments or houses on top. Now the second is a conical mound, which is usually used as a burial spot. Cahokia sits on is about 3.5 square miles and contains 80 mounds. As with most advanced civilizations, the Cahokians had profound knowledge of celestial alignments. Here at Woodhenge, they set up timber poles to indicate the solstices and the equinoxes and other important dates. Let's make our way to Monk's Mound and climb it and see the beautiful scenery you can see from atop. but point out while atop Monk's Mound, look at that beautiful skyline of St. Louis. Now imagine looking down at the plaza and seeing all the artisans working, creating pottery, weapons, everything the civilization needed to survive. After seeing pictures like these, it's hard to imagine the civilization declined and abandoned this site. We're still not 100% sure why they left, but scientists' best guess are due to resource scarcity caused from periods of flooding, periods of drought, and also we know it wasn't due to warfare. By the time the Spanish arrived, this place was abandoned. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. Okay. Uh, there's a lot better videos about Cahokia on the internet, but that one was short enough. I thought it would give you the idea of it. So by the time the Spanish and the French arrived uh, in the Ozarks, Cahokia had been totally abandoned. And uh, there just really wasn't anything left there as far as people. Uh, it reached its peak about 1500 AD, maybe a little earlier. There's evidence that DeSoto's um, explorations, which happened in 1541, uh, that some of the soldiers actually came to the area around Cahokia and uh, they would have still found some people there. Uh, it would have been large, it would have been rather stable. But by the time Marquette came there in 1673, it was totally deserted. So within about 100 years, Cahokia just almost just completely deserted. Why? Again, nobody knows for sure. Uh, very well could have been disease. Uh, De Soto's army was noted for leaving behind disease, particularly venereal disease. And the Indians had no natural immunity to this, and it often caused vast widespread epidemics wherever these Spanish and French soldiers came. When they left, uh, people would die. There's also the chance that it was a naturally occurring pandemic from their own waste. Um, 
one of the problems with Cahokia was probably that they were so large and so uh, successful that the area kept growing and yet uh, that produced a lot of human waste and the result was it probably uh, polluted their water systems and not knowing and not understanding this, uh, it could have resulted in a uh, outbreak of typhoid or diphtheria or something like this. So uh, again, they may have been victims of their own success. All we know is for sure, by the time the French got there in the mid 1600s, uh, Cahokia was a totally abandoned and deserted area where a hundred years before it had been pretty large and pretty thriving. Okay, so that's it for this week. Next week, we're going to talk about the Indian tribes that were located in the Ozarks when the first whites, the first Americans, the Europeans began to come into this area. Uh, the group is called the Osage. And the Osage, again, are one of those tribes that a lot of people don't know that lot about, a lot about. But folks are an extremely interesting tribe. And uh, they had a lot of effect upon the development of the Ozarks. So next week, we're going to talk about the Osage. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about the Cherokee, uh, which is the group of Indians that most people probably associate mostly uh, with in this area, as well as the Appalachian area. So I appreciate you being with me. I uh, hope you've learned something of interest today. Definitely. And, and uh, 